Alright, here we are. Uh, what episode is this? It's episode number 105 of the Cozy Corner of Cinema being recorded on Monday, April 1st, 2024 at 3.50pm. But this ain't no April Fool's joke. This really is episode number 105. So if you're listening to this on April Fool's and you're like, oh, I'm not going to get you know bombarded by any of these hooligan pranks or anything like that, and then you get pranked by it, well, then that means that your day has been fully accomplished. I haven't got goofed on yet today, so there's still time, though. It's definitely still hours in the day, but here we are on this Monday afternoon. A bit of a chill in the air. I got my nice, hot cup of coffee right here in this great cat mug. This is very cool, man. I'm looking at this, and it's just totally a joy to look at. Wow. Cat's kind of sleepy, but it's totally cool. It's uh, got a tail as a handle. That's actually really cool, man. I saw that they were selling those, uh, those Pam's Coffee coffee mugs from the uh, shop in uh, L.A. I wouldn't mind getting one, man, but good lord, those things are $55. It's like $40 and like $12.95 uh, shipping. And, you know, tax two with that, and it's going to come out to $55. It's just insanity. I just can't, can't justify that kind of money on a logo on a mug. But they do look cool, though, so you got to give it that. So if you're interested in that, you can go ahead and look that up. It's on the internet there. It's very cool and all that. Uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it was Easter this past weekend. So hope you guys uh, enjoyed your uh, holiday weekend. Eat some ham, uh, you know, uh, spend some time with your loved ones. Uh, yeah, actually, ironically, I didn't even realize I uh, went to uh, see the new horror film Immaculate this weekend, unaware that it was, uh, or I, I forgot that it was Easter weekend, so it was a um, it was an unintentional viewing, but uh, it seemed uh, appropriate for this weekend to go see that, and uh, I, so I did, and I, I was actually supposed to see that last weekend, but I didn't get an opportunity to. Actually, you know what? No, it wasn't even that. I, it, it, was, uh, it was starting later than I had uh, initially thought. I thought I would have had uh, less time with space in between, so ultimately I decided not to see it and to see something else, but I did see that. That was watched, and uh, I think... I'm pretty caught up on theatrical watches that I wanted to. Last year, I was uh, I was equally as disinterested as I was unable to go to the cinema to see many films. There were many films that I missed out on, unfortunately, but this year I'm trying to make up for that and, and see more films that I have curiosity on, you know. Um because anytime I go to the cinema, I ain't uh, I ain't trying to sit there during the trailers or anything like that. I get there usually about 20 minutes after it officially starts, so I can get there right to the film. Because I swear to God, man, they add so many ads during these trailers. There's I mean, there's ads in between trailers. It is it is absolute insanity. So I try to prioritize um, when I actually get into the cinema to sit down. Um, uh, one of the films that I had mentioned last week that I wanted to give another heads up on was the Vim Vendors documentary Anselm, uh, which I had seen theatrically and is now available on the Criterion channel. Uh, so that is available there. I, I don't know if it was last week or not, but I thought I saw somebody post about that. So if you have the Criterion channel, you can now watch that wonderful documentary. And as well, I think I saw a movie were posting that Perfect Days was coming somewhat soon at least like i don't know maybe i'm misremembering that but i thought i had read they're bringing that so if you have movie as well keep an eye on that and also if you have the criterion channel and movie there's no shortage of great films on either platform that you can just divulge yourself in and be accustomed to the great cinema that's programmed on there it's just totally fantastic just like this coffee i've been seeing some uh traction for the latest um episode of people pictures and that's very cool i really appreciate people giving the opportunity to listen to those uh i think i already have the next episode lined up uh i just gotta get it all together it'll be another blu-ray title i I, I do want to do them just as reviews on their own of the films themselves and not necessarily the release but it just so happens that i'm you know i'm buying all these adult titles and uh, i thought it'd be a good opportunity to kind of put a spotlight on them i mean like the erotic memoirs of a Male Chauvinist Pig was an in-between where that wasn't exactly a new release, but it was still a DVD, or still a release, I should say, like an actual physical release, so that's, that's one thing. But, yeah, I think I'm going to get into episode four sometime soon and work on that. It's great not having a rigid schedule. I don't have to get films done by a certain time. I'm, I'm able to just kind of put them out when I feel like it, and uh, it's been great. I mean, I'm, it's, I've been unintentionally one a week. Um, I can't. I don't know if I'll get one out this week, but, you know, if you know, keep an eye on that if you are interested. Uh, as well as the Kino sale has started. So that's, uh, that's happening now. I was doing a brief kind of a... Uh
scroll through some of the pages, uh, looking at some of the titles there, there's uh, there's no shortage of great titles there either. Um, I haven't picked up anything yet, but there's definitely a couple 4Ks I'll definitely grab. Uh, that, that John Garfield noir that I uh, watched like months ago, I'm blanking on the name of it. Uh, I really like that one. I might actually grab that. That was like $9. And uh, did I not silence my telephone? I guess I didn't. But I'm blanking on the name of that one. Um... And uh, I wanted to grab that, I don't know if it's actually on sale or not, the Louis Mal one uh, that I'm blanking on the name of that was a recent um, release. Baby, Do- not Baby, Doc Stanley, a Kazan film. Uh, what the hell's the name of that film? I'm blanking on the name of it right now. My memory is, is awful lately. Um, it's one of Brick Shields. It's Pretty Baby, I think it's called. I'm just going to look it up. Pretty Baby, that's right. Look at that, I got it. Yeah, I, uh, I thought that was Kino. Maybe, maybe not. But either way, I thought uh, I wanted to look to see if that was uh, on sale. I definitely want to give that a watch. Big fan of Louis Mail. Big fan of his filmography. I mean, two of his films mean my top ten. Favorite films of 1958. And everything I've seen from him has been good. I watched uh, Black Moon a little while ago. That was a very good film. And, uh, of course, he's done many, many works. He's done... Overall La Font, uh, Elevator to the Gallows, uh, The Lovers, Murmur of the Heart. I mean, he's just a wonderful filmmaker. I haven't looked at any of his documentaries, though. I know he's he did like a handful of TV documentaries later on that I've been curious about. I think those are actually on the Criterion channel as well, to my knowledge, but I'd have to look more in depth into them. But uh, just a wonderful filmmaker in his own right. Uh, he just... He just yeah, I mean, there's still a lot I got to go through. I, mean, I, I have I've only put a dent into I've only put a slight dent into his filmography, but uh, that'll be watched at some point when the opportunity arises itself. But yeah, man, it's uh, it's interesting that we've been getting so many of these celebrity kind of documentaries the past uh, year or so. We got uh, uh, my favorite of the bunch, which has been Senior, uh, directed by Chris Smith. Um, about Robert Downey Sr. I thought that was such a... Of all of these recent celebrity documentaries, that one has been the most emotionally um, investing, investing, I should say. Most, it has the most emotional investment of any of these because on one hand, it's a look at Robert Downey Sr. as a filmmaker and the experimental films he was making of Greaser's Palace and Putney Swope and all these really excellent films that have, uh, have kind of uh, been staples of... of uh, cult film fans and of the sort. Actually, you know what? I have Danny Perry's cult films books in the other room, and I should look to see if he's covered any Robert Downey Sr. films. Uh, an acquaintance was generous enough to gift me those books, and and I tell you, those are just such wonderful, wonderful, cozy reads, and I, I'd love to, to see if he has any listed of, of those in there. Um, but uh, with that documentary, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about that, but as well as Robert Downey Jr., who is, of course, a big actor, uh, just just won uh, an Academy Award for Oppenheimer, did a brilliant job in that film, rightfully deserved the Academy Award for that, but uh, it's him coming to terms with the fact that Senior is probably not going to be around much longer, and it's sort of a last hurrah for him, and it's just a, a brilliant documentary, it's one that has just grown in my mind and has become one of my favorite documentaries of recent years. We also had the Michael J. Fox one still. Which was good, too. I, I enjoyed it uh, about the life and hardships of Michael J. Fox, about his acting career, where he wanted to go with it, and then ultimately the MS uh, complications, the, the debilitating movement of his, uh, intentional movement of his body and the problems that came with it. But he's an inspiration. He has a great outlook on life. He is just, he's somebody who didn't let this kind of put him down. He realizes the hardships and the struggles that he has to face, but he is going to push through and if you remember, if you got, any of you guys watched Curb Your Enthusiasm, he has one of, uh, has a gr- great moments with Larry David on that show with, uh, I don't give it away, but he's wearing these ridiculous, he's wearing this boots that's uh, upsetting Larry, and uh, give that a watch. But anyways, we got a new documentary on uh, Apple, on Apple TV, and it's about Steve Martin. It's actually called Steve and then Martin, a documentary in two pieces. This is directed by, I want to get the name up here, because he's a famous documentary filmmaker, and IMDb is not interacting me. It's by... Why do they not list the director first? Just the stars. That's crazy. It's, uh... Well, I guess because they consider it like a mini-series or something like that. They're not going to have one director per each. But, uh... 
Good lord, IMDb needs to get with their website. What the hell's going on here, man? It's uh, Morgan Neville. That's right. Morgan Neville, who did uh, some big documentaries, did 20 Feet from Stardom. He did uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor a couple years ago. Uh, the the uh, Mr. Rogers one. He did Road uh, Roadrunner. Uh, I always forget he did Roadrunner. That was a good documentary. I wasn't so crazy about Won't You Be My Neighbor, but uh, I thought that was a, kind of a, not a great film. But uh, I thought Roadrunner was really good. And actually, The Love Me When I'm Dead was really good as well. About uh, yeah, the Orson Welles is the other side of the wind. Funny how there's still no release of that, man. It's, it's, it's crazy. That's, that's the problem with these films that go to streaming. They just get lost on streaming. So now, films like The Other Side of the Wind and Senior, unless you have Netflix, you cannot watch them unless you go through other methods. And it's a real shame, man. Some Criterion's gotta, you know, gotta pick up some of these titles, man. Or, or Netflix's gotta release these titles, man. I know they put out, I know there's a lot of output there, but. You know, I guess it's easier said than done. They have so many originals that it's, uh, you know, it's one thing. But it's just a real shame that some of these films are going to get lost to streaming services. But we have a documentary in two parts, then and now. And uh, it's overall the runtime comes in at about a little under three and a half hours. IMDb listed as three hours and 11 minutes. Although IMDb's runtimes in general have never been totally accurate for me. There's always been a bit of an issue where the runtime and what's actually listed is is different. And I don't mean, like, different versions of films. I mean, like, it just is not even accurate, man. Um, but we have Steve Martin here. We follow in the first part uh, his trials and tribulations being a stand-up comedian, doing these different kinds of acts. He's, you know, putting himself out there. He's, he's you know, he's not afraid to make a fool of himself. He's not afraid of... People aren't enjoying the act. He's going to do something completely different. And, you know, I talk about the time when he was coming around. It's, uh, you know, kind of like uh, a lot of the hippie stuff. And in the 70s, some of like the more nihilistic kind of sentiments. Uh, but he was doing this really wacky stuff. Some people got it. Some people didn't. Comedy is so subjective that it's, you can't really blame people for totally, for not totally understanding it. And uh, now the first part of this I thought was fantastic. I thought... Uh, it was a great look. Uh, the editing was was great. They do great little inserts with um, little like cutouts, and they have a lot of interviews with a lot of his contemporaries, a lot of people who uh, have are comedians themselves, who are fans of his work and all that. And where it ends is when he starts is when he starts his film career in 1979 with The Jerk. And I thought, oh man, part two is going to be more like uh, that book that I was mentioning before that I listened to, Wild and Crazy Guys, because there's a great. Uh, there's a great section in that book about Steve Martin where it talks about sort of him wanting to distance himself from this persona, him wanting to do more serious work. And I don't mean like, you know, Shakespeare serious, but I'm talking more so he wanted to be kind of respected more as an actor. He didn't want to just be pigeonheld into this, no pun intended, but this wild and crazy guy. Well, actually, yeah, pun intended, but it works out in favor. And and that book does such a great job at, uh, at detailing his ups and downs of trying to be taken more seriously as a performer. And this documentary is bizarre because when you get to part two, it almost entirely skims over his film career that I thought was so bizarre. There are brief mentions to some of his films like Planes, Trains, and Automobiles and Roxanne and uh, Parenthood. But it's not even that it goes into what he's currently doing now. It's, it's, or, or his, not even resurgence, so to speak, but you know, he has that... He has that show now, Only Murders in the Building, with uh, Martin uh, Short, which is a very popular show on Hulu. I've never watched it, but I've heard it very good. And I thought that, all right, well, maybe they'll go into now where, you know, he's he's coming back and he's doing, uh, you know, tours with Martin Short and they're going on the road and this and that. And it really does, and it really, strangely enough, meanders in the second part to the point where it almost feels like a different director and editor. Um kind of stepped in. And that's not to say that it isn't entertaining, of course. It still has a steady pace. The conversation, the anecdotes are good. Steve Martin's a fascinating guy. He's a, he's an intelligent guy. He's a guy where I'm not the biggest fan of his comedy, so to speak, but he's so well-spoken. He's such a smart guy, and I just love hearing him talk, hearing him talk about his influences, different films, where his, his personal life, his complicated relationship with his father. Also, explain that. I forgot to mention two other ones. Which were the uh, Arnold the Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, documentary on Netflix, as well as the Sylvester Stallone documentary Sly. So those have to be worth mentioning as well. The Arnold one was fantastic. I think I talked about it on the show, but I loved that documentary. And the Sly one, it was good, but I wish it was better. Um, but 
that's a whole other conversation. My point is, though, is even though I wasn't as big on part two, and I think I may have done it differently if I was in the helm of this, uh, it is overall a very entertaining look into uh, Steve Martin's complicated uh, life as a performer. Um, because early, it, it, uh, in his early film career, man, when he was doing into the, I would say into the early 80s, he had, he had kind of a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He had kind of an awkward footing with what he wanted to do because, you know, the jerk wasn't totally a big success at first. And, uh, but, you know, people eventually became kind of a cult thing and people like it. You know, uh, the jerk is, it's, it's one of these films where I'm not, uh, it's, I'm not really a fan of, but there are individual sequences in that film that I find funny and I, and I get the appeal of it. Uh, but then he was doing films like The Man with Two Brains, um, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, uh, which is I, actually, I think, is one of my favorite films of his. And, of course, he goes on to do Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and he has a small role in Little Shop of Horrors, and he does a bunch of stuff. Actually, one of my favorite films of his that I don't even remember if they even mentioned it or not was Bowfinger with, with Eddie Murphy. That's, that's more into the 90s. We have the, him in that film and, and Heather Graham, and uh, it's, a, it's a really, uh, really enjoyable, entertaining film. But it's a worthy documentary as well. I think Apple are doing really cool stuff. It's, uh, you know, when I'm looking on their uh, uh, services and they're recommending uh, uh, different things, there are different kind of historical documentaries that are cool, like, uh, you know, like they had that John Wilkes Booth one, which I think is actually a series, may have not been a documentary, but either way, it's still very cool. I think Apple are, are doing unique stuff in their own right. I mean, they have their originals as well, or films that go there. They have, um, I think they, I don't think they distributed Napoleon, but it was one of their films, if that, if that makes sense. I don't remember... Who distributed Napoleon? Um, but I think I saw like Argyle pop up as a film coming soon. That was a recent uh, kind of action comedy. But uh, then they had other films I liked a lot, like Shock Shot Real Smooth, and um, even a film that I wasn't a fan of, Coda. I mean, that wins Best Picture that year. So they have, they definitely have their footing. They know what they're doing. They have quality content, and I think that uh, they may be being slept on. Um, and when, you know, you get really solid documentaries like this, it's not worth sleeping on. It's worth uh, actually going on and watching. So for fans or not fans of uh, his comedy alike, I would say that this documentary is worth watching. I watched it all in one piece in its entirety. Because uh, at the end of part one, I was thinking like, oh, man, I got to I gotta jump into part two. And then part two, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not as engaged. But still, solid documentary overall. Uh, I still recommend, of course, Senior and uh, Arnold. Those are my two favorites of these kind of uh, documentaries. But it's funny. Somebody else mentioned briefly. There was a, there's a lot of brand movies coming out. There's a lot of uh, I'm thinking like they had a they had a thing for like the Pop Tart movie coming out, and then they had uh, the Tetris film, and they had the Hot Cheetos film, and they had Blackberry, and they had uh, uh, there were some others. I'm trying to think. Oh, they had Air about the. Uh, Air Jordans, and it's just uh, it's a strange phenomenon, man, about all these products, you know, it's, uh, makes you think, what other films could they make products of, what were crazy products, maybe they could movie about the Segway, or maybe they could, uh, make a movie about the Pogo Stick, or maybe make a movie about, uh, Four Loco, remember Four Loco, when kids were drinking that and they were in the hospital, what the hell was that about, man? I don't know. Actually, by the time this is out, they'll probably announce, hey, we're at the Polo Stick movie. And I mean, I guess you could probably say the Lego movie as well, but that's not a film about the creation of this product. It's about, um, I only saw the first one. I didn't see any other ones, but it's about the, you know, the characters are actually Legos and, for the most part and stuff. But anyway, we're not talking about Legos. We're not talking about Pop-Tarts. We're talking about another film, uh, another seminal cozy film. One of my favorite films, actually. It is a film from 1969, going into an era where we're getting more nihilistic, downbeat kind of films. We get such a wonderful comedy, a Western comedy directed by Burt Kennedy, uh, written by William Bowers, and starring James Garner. You have a great cast here. We're talking about, of course, support your local sheriff. Now, listen to this cast. You have James Garner, Walter Brennan, Bruce Stern, Jack Elam, Harry Morgan, Joan Hackett, man, uh, 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 it's Dick Haynes, man, it's a wonderful cast. And I had seen this film originally a little while ago on Amazon, it was streaming on there, it was one that Brian Sauer had mentioned on his, uh, show, and, um, uh, I mean, I, I line up a lot with this film taste. I've mentioned him on the show many, many a time. And uh, this was one that he spoke very highly of. And um, I ended up buying this on Blu-ray eventually from Kino. And this is just a total cozy, just a wonderful film. Uh, James Garner plays this guy, Jason. He, 
he comes into town. He and they, they need a sheriff. I mean, this town is out of control. You have Bruce Stern in this town. I mean, they they, they go out to the uh, to the saloon and there's just problems being being uh, caused. Uh, Bruce Stern tricks a guy into uh, uh, pulling out his gun so Bruce Stern could jump on him and shoot him first. And everyone's and he's like, you all saw he he drew his gun on me first. And like, yeah, we saw him. And and James Garner's like, nah, man. I mean, you totally tricked him into that. And uh, everyone's like, oh, you don't talk to him that way. That's that's wild. And uh, from there. James Garner starts to, uh, he becomes the sheriff of the town. He starts to clean up the town, starts to, uh, you know, become interested in uh, Prudy, played by Joan Hackett, and we just get a myriad jokes there. There's a whole ridiculous scene where they're all fighting in the mud, and everybody's just getting, like, messy and dirty, and they're just beating the hell out of each other, man. It's wild. I mean, no one's left unharmed. I mean, she's going in there with, like, a long, kind of, like, um, like a long, like, uh, like, like block of wood. And she's just beating the hell out of people, man. It, it's completely wild. It's a film where consequences, like you know, murder and violence, it's, it's really just kind of like not even a, a, a real thing. I mean, they almost really kind of play it off where Bruce Stern is so casually killing people that uh, they don't even think twice about it. You know, it's sort of just like the, the film is never brought down because of uh, you know any of these kind of moments of uh, you know violence or or uh, murder. Um, because, I mean, the thing is that the cast themselves are so great, you know, what I was mentioning before, and a lot of the individual sequences are, I mean, you can watch this film without having to watch it from beginning to end. I mean, that's ideal, of course, but I think it's a film that is also, uh, uh, it's individual sequences as well. There's a whole uh, kind of bit about them, like, actually building the jail, and there's, like, a hole in the wall, and, and Bruce Stern is, like, causing problems for it. It's just such a, a goofy time, and it's interesting that... Uh, a film like this would come out in 1969. We're getting more right into the, uh, you know, into the 70s, getting a lot more nihilistic films. I mean, this is the same year as The Wild Bunch, and a film like that, which is taking a far more serious approach to um, the idea of Westerns in general, sort of the end of an era into another one, intentionally or unintentionally, you know, there's a lot to speculate on there. So a film like this that almost seems like uh, almost even a throwback in a way to um, maybe something you would catch in like the, the 50s, because it's, it's not even that. The humor itself or the, or the jokes are dated specifically for... Uh, um, the, the late 1960s. It just so happens that this is where it comes from, where you can see, I mean, James Garner uh, in the lead role here. I think he's really suited for this, but you can see, you know, a lot of uh, actors kind of in a role like this, you know, and, and not just him, but throughout the town as well. It's like Jackie Elmer, like Walter Brennan and all that, but rewatching it again, I mean, comedies, I think in general, are a little trickier to uh, try and revisit more than once. Um, some more than others, but I talked about recently with some films, like I'd mentioned, just talking about like Freddy Got Fingered and a film like that I can watch again and again because it's just so funny that I'm always going to find it funny, and, and with a case like this here, even if I'm not always laughing out loud, it's still just so enjoyable overall, I mean, it's just such a wonderful cozy film, and there was a sequel that I have seen but I don't remember a lot about it it was Support Your Local Gunfighter, and I don't even remember if Okay, so James Garner was in it again, as well as... Was this one... Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Burt Kennedy is directing again, but instead we have James Edward Grant writing here. And I remember liking this film enough, but truthfully I don't remember enough about it to really make much of uh, any kind of uh, impression. But still, you have Jack Elam coming back... Um, Thing. Yeah, Henry Jones as well, but then you also have Joan Blondell and uh, Suzanne Plachette and Harry Morgan. So that one will uh, have to be revisited at some point. I know that, well, I mean, Support Your Local Sheriff has a Kino Blu ray, which I do have. Um, the. Sorry, just looking at the thing here. Uh, I don't know if Support Your Local Gunfighter has a. Blu-ray as well, and actually, I say sequel, it's really not, it's really just sort of, um, in the same vein, sort of, so I really shouldn't even say that, but, uh, I mean, especially with the Kino sale going on right now, I don't know if this is a part of it, I don't know what's in print and what isn't, there, there are some titles I've bought that are now suddenly out of print, so I'm a little unfamiliar with which ones are and aren't, but if you are able to come across this, this is a very easy film to find, it's streaming on, on all over the place, as well as having a Blu-ray, and the Blu-ray looks very good as well. It's a, it's a really good-looking film. I love um, 
I love westerns from this period where they just look very sharp, very crisp. They don't quite have that dirtiness, but they're still, uh, you know, they're still really well shot. You know, I think that's all great. And, um, yeah, like I said, it's a total cozy film. It's uh, only the second time that I've seen this film, but one that will be revisited upon further speculation. Actually, funny enough, funnily enough, I'm thinking of now. I'm thinking of the Gunfighter with uh, Gregory Peck from 1950. That's also a great film as well. Not a comedy, but a really great western as well. Directed by Henry King. Jimmy Ringo is coming into a small town, and everybody knows his kind of reputation. He's a great gunfighter. Everyone wants a piece of the action. They want to be the one to take him down. So he's sitting in this bar, and he wants to be left alone. And uh, everyone is just on his ass, man. They, they will not leave him alone. And it's sort of uh, a far more character-driven Western than it is anything with any sort of a specul uh, uh, any sort of a spectacle or violence. It's a far more quieter film with a great lead performance by Gregory Peck. You also have Helen Westcott in the film as well, Carl Malden, Verna Felton. It's a uh, it, this got a release from Criterion a little while ago. But it was one of my favorite discoveries of the past couple of years. I had been unfamiliar with it until that Blu-ray came out, but it's uh, a really just excellent look at to uh, uh, the life the, the short life as somebody in this position really can have. This isn't a life where you're gonna go, you're gonna die of old age. Somebody's you're gonna always be looking around the corner, looking over your shoulder, looking over. You know, somebody's always gonna want to be the one to come get you. And that mythic sort of hero is really kind of deconstructed in a way. Almost at times feels like a play, the way that it's primarily set in this one saloon. Uh, while occasionally going outside of it. It's a film that I have not seen in quite some time, but it's still so vivid in my memory of just being one of the strongest Westerns from this period, I think. And um, one of the most smartly written, I should say, as well. Because um, the writers on this film include... You have uh, William Bowers and William Sellers. And it also says, from a story by Bowers, Andre de Toth... And the script and consultant uncredited from none other than Roger Corman and Nunnally Johnson. So a film worthy as well to watch. And I think that's where this episode is going to end. So thank you yet again for listening to another episode, or perhaps your first episode. Either way, thank you for taking the time out of your day to choose to listen. I appreciate it, and I appreciate any and all feedback, positive or negative. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I will be back next time.